Well, Norman Ramsey is certainly someone who needs no introduction, but that is not going to stop me from giving him one. Um, almost everything in modern atomic physics can be connected to Norman in one way or another. At NIST, we've been especially in his debt. His method of separated oscillatory fields, for which he received the 1989 Nobel Prize in Physics, is used in the atomic clocks, which NIST and standards labs uh, throughout the world maintain the unit of time. He invented the hydrogen maser with Dan Kleppner, and the hydrogen maser is still an indispensable tool of time and frequency standards. His student, Dan Kleppner, was my thesis advisor. He was uh, advisor to Dave Wineland, who in NIST Boulder is pioneering both new frequency standards and the new field of quantum information. His student, Dave Pritchard, was the thesis advisor to Eric Cornell, NIST's newly anointed Nobel laureate. Thinking about all these things and trying to describe Norman's uh, relationship to uh, atomic physics, the closest thing that I can say is that Norman Ramsey is its patron saint. Norman has taught and inspired us to do science with intelligent, intelligence and insight, and also with humanity and humility. All of these things about Norman are well known. Less well known, perhaps, is his skill as a raconteur. I've often been spellbound by his tales of how textbook science was done in real life. And today he's uh, uh, consented to share with us his personal anecdotes about great physicists. Norman. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I have to start out by emphasizing that despite that wonderful screen giving the title of the lecture, it is wrong. Uh, the uh, actual title is Personal Anecdotes About Great Physicists. I mean, that's a little, you'll see it's a little different. These are going to be anecdotes. Um, and now, this is a talk I gave uh, last summer at uh, the Division of Atomic and Molecular and Optical Physics as an after-dinner talk. That's what it was prepared at. But then I was asked to repeat it here. I warned them, you know, it's not the clo physics colloquium. It's an after-dinner talk. But they said, no, uh, I should do it. So I'm obedient, and I am doing it. But beware, uh, it is more uh, in that uh, form. Now, the reason I agreed to talk on this subject then and talk on it here, now, this will be a little different from the, incidentally, than the after-dinner talk. I'm making some modification. But nevertheless, the uh, reason I agreed to talk both there and now is that on this subject, an anecdote about great physicists, is I tend, found I personally tend to divide my knowledge of physics into two categories. There is the done, part done by the ancients, that being that uh, uh, where you have fixed laws, Archimedes principle, uh, Newton's laws. These are by people I really don't know, and I don't know people who knew them, and it seems always like a sort of a static substance. I mean, they have nice fixed laws, and. Uh, uh, this is something that came down from them. Then there is another category of physics, which is the physics that's occurred, that's been developed uh, since at least I had friends who knew the people who did the development. And that's much more fun. That's a dynamic, I feel that's a dynamic kind of physics. It's changing. It's changed by people like ourselves and uh, much more interesting. So um, I think I liked, the reason I'm willing to talk on this subject is I'd like to get more people to have a better feeling for what was done uh, much earlier. And I've had there the good, two good fortunes. I had a, uh, an opportunity quite early to uh, meet many people, and maybe the other good fortune of uh, living for quite a long time. So I can go back quite a long uh, ways. Now, there's a boundary condition that I'm putting on the talk, with one exception. None of the people I'm going to talk about are still alive. The reason for that is twofold. First place, it saves a lot of argument. Uh, <laughs> and secondly, uh, it, uh, uh, it pre prevents the following problem, which I realize. Namely, if I have to talk uh, anecdotes about great physicists, having one of my current friends come up to me and say, well, I know you have a lot of anecdotes about me, uh, so you must not consider me a great physicist. Well, I say that's because you're still alive. Aren't you glad? Uh, so with this, uh, let us uh, uh, 
No, but the one other thing I should warn in advance is to, to be anecdotal, it's really something a little contrary to uh, what the person is. In other words, if you want to be anecdotal about a rather stupid physicist, if he's had one great idea, that is an anecdote. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, these are all great physicists whom I greatly admired, so the anecdote is a little bit to the negative side, so they're humans. Uh, don't, so don't please interpret that that I'm trying to downgrade them at all. No, I think it makes them even better to realize that they can do this great work and still be ordinary people. Well, now I was able to get an early start on this subject by uh, being uh, given a scholarship. I was a mathematics concentrator at Columbia as an undergraduate, and they gave me a scholarship to England, which I sort of startled them by saying, fine, I'll accept it if I can use this to convert from being a mathematician to a physicist. But they were very nice. They let me do it. They got a little revenge later when, after the two years was up, uh, Columbia offered me, the physics department offered me $1,000 a year, $950 a year to be a teaching fellow, whereas they offered uh, $3,000 to be an instructor. I turned them down even despite that. Well, in any case, they, uh, 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 that meant that at an early age, when I was 20, I really got to know quite a few people because I went to uh, Cambridge. And at that time, let me just name some of the people who were on the staff. One other, and I'll talk about this a little more, is J.J. Thompson, who was still lecturing there. He was then uh, master of uh, Trinity College and lecturing. Lord Rutherford, who was one of the reasons that made this a great center. Uh, Paul Dirac, Max Born. Uh, John Cockcroft, uh, Eddington, uh, R.H. Fowler, Chadwick, Maurice Goldhaber was a young teaching fellow. It was really quite a stellar array to meet and get to know moderately well some of them at the age of when I was only 20 years old. Uh, well, uh, let me now start uh, by talking about J.J. Thompson. I particularly treasure my knowledge of him for the reason that that's my furthest personal reach back. And I have to remind you that, I mean, he's the discoverer of the electron. And I find it rather astounding and very impressive to the advance of physics that in just the overlapping active careers of just two people, namely J.J. Uh, Thompson and myself, we've gone all the way from, at his time, beginning of his time, he, no one knew where the electron was there. Uh, and he discovered the electron. He also uh, was able to, uh, he made the first model of the atom, a terrible model, a so-called plum pudding model. I mean, it had nothing to do with what the atom is, it's sort of a static model. Uh, uh, it had, it, uh, but uh, it was, just shows how f ignorant we were. Of course, there was no quantum mechanics, no uh, uh, relativity theory, uh, no fancy, no electronics experiments, uh, no, no, uh, uh, magnetic resonances, none of this at that time. And when you look at what we have now, which is what it's done, where we have every, all the things that are going on at the lab here with uh, 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 Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, all of that has occurred in that intervening time. It's a really a been a remarkable century in physics that so much could happen uh, in that short period. Now, now as to J.J. Thompson himself, uh, the, uh, I, I was, a, after I was 20 old year old, he was a very old, old man, it seemed to me. Uh, he was uh, really quite ancient. Uh, he, uh, um, his uh, teeth used to fall out in his lecture at intervals. And uh, uh, I was impressed how old he was. But still, his, his keen interest in physics was still very great. I mean, he wanted to lecture to it. Now, it was a do pretty dullish lectures at that time. Uh, in fact, the class, of course, at Cambridge, it was a little optional how many, how long you stay, what did your lectures. We started out with a class of about 50, and uh, after a couple of weeks, it had dwindled to about 10, half of whom were Americans. But I'm very glad that I was in the half that stayed, uh, among the uh, Americans who stayed, because it was really very interesting to see uh, his interest, his point of view, uh, and uh, he, he was really a fascinating physicist and still as keenly interested in the subject then as I think he had ever been. Uh, but now I did find one thing in, in preparing this lecture, a little disconcerting, several, several times not as a lecture, but as in talking to people, had made these comments about what an old man he was. 
and I suddenly discovered last summer in preparing my talk at Daimalt that at the time I was doing this, uh, he was uh, aged uh, 80, and uh, I'm now age 86, so uh, uh, beware. Uh, uh, however, I warn you, my teeth, whatever happens, my teeth won't fall out. They're all my own. Uh, then uh, the, uh, well, the next person I want to talk about is Lord Rutherford. And it really is a little bit about my development, perhaps more than about Rutherford. In any case, I went to, he had a course on Constitution of Matter, a great course that it was supposed to be, and I was terribly disappointed. I, in fact, remember writing an after a month or two, writing a uh, letter to my parents saying, you know, he certainly lived up to my expectations of what a British Lord should be like. He had a cutaway tweed jacket. I've never seen anybody else wear such a thing before. Uh, looked like a morning coat, but made out of brown tweed. Uh, he had wing collars and a sort of a fancy tie. And, uh, uh, and uh, in, in seminars, he asked innumerable questions that were, half of which were really pretty stupid. Uh, they were ones that most of us as undergraduates there could he could knew the answer to. I mean, why he wasted his time. So in any case, uh, I, my comment to my parents was, they lived up to my ideals of a, of a uh, great, um, um, of, a, of a typical British lord, but not of a great physicist. So I was disappointed. Uh, but uh, then particularly I'd been a mathematician, I'd been a mathematician up to that time. When Rutherford arrived, Rutherford scattering all was a complete disaster. I mean, he started through the derivation, it fell apart completely, and he said to go home and work it out. And uh, so, uh, you know, it really diminished, it was rather a disappointment to me. But then the following summer, my tutor at that time was Maurice Goldhaber, a young refugee from Germany who sort of had a part-time fellowship in one of the colleges. And uh, he was, I was, he had me write some essays for him over the summer. They liked having essays. And well, I was writing the essay uh, away from a library. I'd actually gone home for the summer at that point. And the only, I'd, I'd brought Rutherford's notes back with me because I didn't want to throw them out, but I didn't, I thought I might as well bring them back there. I didn't need them in Cambridge. Well, I, the only place I could look up the thing, some information that I needed uh, was in Rutherford's notes. I'd diligently taken notes, best American fashion, taken notes while thinking what stupid lectures they were. And uh, uh, they were, it had the answers to the questions I wanted. I really had enough to write a good essay from it. But in the process of reading it, I found that le the lectures themselves were fascinating. If you concentrated on a physical point of view, his, his way he, he approached ideas was fascinating. So actually, in Cambridge, it's always optional what, how many times you go to a course. I went back to the same course the following year. And I, whereas the first time I was terribly disappointed, I consider it one of the best courses I'd ever taken. Uh, uh, at that time, I was, it was probably marked by a transition from being a mathematician to being a physicist. Uh, I mean, I was very interested in his physical insight, his points of view. I mean, he would say, well, why don't you, in scattering, why don't you, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, why don't you worry about the uh, uh, the scattering of, of the alpha particles by the electrons? Said, well, it's like being scattered by the mosquitoes when you walk through uh, the woods. Well, I understood what he meant, although he'd never seen mosquitoes as they were in Massachusetts and uh, <laughs> uh, Maine. Uh, those do deflect me, but nevertheless, uh, the point was right. I mean, in sort of a physically, he could discount it. His point of view was very good uh, physics-wise, uh, otherwise. And likewise, I soon learned that although the, that year also in, in the seminars, he asked a pretty big array of stupid questions. In and amongst the stupid questions were a number of very insightful key questions. And in fact, it was quite apparent that almost all of the uh, experiments then being do, done at the uh, Cavendish Laboratory were actually inspired by his, his very insightful uh, questions that he'd raised in such seminars. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who could eliminate the bad things, and uh, he could too. And uh, I really had a great admiration for him. It was perfectly clear that that laboratory, he was the center 
of the great things that had been done in that laboratory and still were being done there. Well now, another uh, uh, one that I took a course from was Dirac, Dirac's course in quantum mechanics. And there I hadn't had any, really any quantum mechanics before, and uh, uh, his uh, lectures on quantum mechanics for me were not actually very good. This was my fault probably, but also he was a pretty dull lecturer. And in fact, he essentially read from his book. He actually had the book uh, right at hand, and he checked up on his things and sort of copied the equations out from it. It was not an inspiring set of lectures. And I understand he wasn't all that inspiring for many of the graduate students uh, in that uh, uh, he, uh, well, as known, one graduate student, I think, went up and said, I'd like to work with you. Uh, can you suggest a problem? And his response was, well, if I knew a problem, I'd solve it. Uh, uh, this is not quite the ideal thing to care. So that it wiped out, he only had a very few graduate students, but of course he had some very good ones. Abdus Salam was the Nobel Prize winner, uh, was one of his, uh, was one of his uh, graduate students. But uh, uh, I think his course, in fact, I really learned quantum mechanics uh, later by uh, this great book of a, of a former, well, he wasn't at the time, a director of, uh, of uh, uh, NIST or an NB, NBS, uh, and namely Ed Conan. Ed's, I think one of the great books of all time is Conan and Shortley's uh, book on uh, theory of atomic spectra. It's also a great way, after you've read that book, it's easy to understand Dirac. Uh, but don't do it in the other order, which is what I did. Uh, so, well, now let's see. But uh, Eddington, we gave lectures. I mean, he's a great writer. I mean, he had written, well, the fundamental book on, the only really good book uh, on relativity theory was written by him. And his writings, of popular writings, were, were great. But he was even worse as a lecturer than Dirac. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, read his book. He had memorized the book. Uh, <laughs> And basically, you could hear, as he was lecturing on, you could think he, he had these beautiful expressions he'd put in the book. It's a very well-written book. But he was obviously trying to memorize not merely what, the, what, what he was talking about, but what, uh, uh, what he, the way he'd said it. So he had the right kind of a language. And it was rather dull uh, listening to. Uh, now let, let, let you get the impression that all the lectures were bad. Uh, that's not true. I mean, uh, Cockcroft was an excellent classroom lecturer and a uh, number of others. It was, it was a great place. But uh, uh, as I say, I'm telling some of the things that weren't maybe so. Well, let me now shift to the next category. I could, could go on with the rest of the people uh, that we had uh, there, but I want me to get through it in a time. I'd like to shift over now to what happened to me right after that. Namely, when I was... Uh, at uh, Cambridge, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Maurice Goldhaber, who had been my tutor part of the time, gave me assignments to write things. And one of the things he asked me to write about was uh, nuclear magnetic moments and the measurements of it. And this got me started reading some things. And I meant that <coughs> I learned, I read about what the work Robbie had been done. This was before there was any magnetic resonance, but he'd been doing experiments deflecting atoms in, in homogeneous magnetic fields, and from this, uh, you, you did really a very ingenious experiment. That really appealed to me. And there was a certain advantage also to me going back to Columbia because they knew me fairly well there, and I could skip taking any courses at Columbia. I just used the so my my courses in graduates for graduate school were taken as an undergraduate at Cambridge, and then I came back and just did research with Robbie uh, when I uh, returned. Uh, but uh, and this is what got me started on this, was the work I had done uh, at uh, Cambridge. Well, now, I could lecture for a couple of hours on anecdotes about Robbie. I mean, I really uh, uh, have lots of them, but I want to uh, teach it. And I think he was a really great uh, teacher uh, in a different sense. I mean, his, 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 his lectures, well, I never took a course from him, uh, but his... Uh, his standard course was uh, a course in statistical mechanics, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, which was notably infamous as being very badly disorganized. In fact, there was a, uh, after, after, I think whatever, something like his 60th or 80th birthday, 
there was a uh, meeting call of all of his of, uh, of his key graduate students and and uh, and collaborators on experiments, and each thought well. And in fact, this was uh, uh, when. Um, um, the, oops. Well, in any case, it was started with a meeting. The president's uh, science advisor at that time uh, was during the Carter regime. Uh, well, skip it. Uh, any case, he started off with an after-dinner speech before. So he d he was not a physicist. But, uh, but he had taken Robbie's course, and he started the evening before this meter in honor of Robbie by giving a lecture on what a great teacher he was, but what a terrible classroom lecturer. He was a great teacher because he had these number of very distinguished graduate students and the coal barkers, got Nobel Prizes and whatnot, but uh, he was a uh, uh, terribly disorganized lecture. Well, that started things going. Then the rest of the people came, all started their lecture, all his former students, with their examples of uh, what a terrible classroom lecture he was in. Uh, I mean, Leon Letterman pointed out the fact the theory of when he was a student was that during the war, his lecture notes had gotten scrambled up and he'd not had time to put them back in order. Uh, well, I was able to make my contribution. I'd never taken his course, so I couldn't do my contribution there, but I talked to him about it and it's why his uh, uh, lectures were so disorganized. And he told me why. He said, look, what are the two most important things that a professor can convey to a student? One is to give him some self-confidence and two is teach him how do you, how do you, what do you do when you get stuck? Well, he said, now how do you teach this? Well, get stuck. Uh, how do you get stuck? Don't prepare. <laughs> and he did that. I mean, he was in his classroom lectures. He would start deriving something. It would go all to pieces and to sort of the class and he would work it out. Uh, and I think it was a very effective way. He was also a, a very great person to do uh, research with uh, in that he did have excellent ideas, inspiring ideas. He also gave a lot of freedom to his graduate students. Uh, I mean, he would start you off on an experiment and uh, then sort of leave you alone for quite a while, a couple around maybe a month later to see how it was going. Uh, and uh, in fact, he would sometimes uh, say, stop into the student and say, well, what are you, what are you doing? And it, the student would parrot back his statement of what he was doing that Robbie had given him and to start off with and why it was important. And then he'd be apt to say, but why are you wasting your time on such a stupid thing as that? Well, this is very disconcerting to a graduate student. However, it makes him think. I and mean, all of us quickly learned that one answer you couldn't give, you had to really believe and be convinced of your answer before you gave it to Robbie. And he would, he would appreciate it if it was, if you said uh, he was doing that because, uh, uh, well, I thought what you proposed was not a good thing to do. And uh, he, uh, I think, uh, really inspired us uh, uh, to do things. And when the, when the experiments were going on, getting interesting data, he was down there, uh, except in one of our most critical periods, he was in California, but if he was around in the Boston area, in the uh, New York area, he would be around, uh, he, he didn't do anything physical about the experiments, uh, but he would nervously sit there watching the data and thinking about the data as it was coming in. He uh, would whittle on, uh, we had big submarine batteries. These are days before you had good voltage control. So we had, our, we needed magnetic fields very stable. So we had these submarine batteries about this high in a wooden frame. And then he would whittle away on the leg of the, of the submarine battery. Well, this got, got uh, Gerald Zach, that was doing these experiments, Jack, this collaborative with Gerald Zacharias, got him, him worried about it. Uh, you know, this, this huge battery would collapse and spill acid all over the lab. Uh, the leg running down. So one of my jobs as a graduate student was always to get a nice piece of wood, uh, perfect for whittling, uh, from the wood shop and have this around so he could do his whittling uh, in, uh, in, without destroying the apparatus. <laughs> well, uh, but as I say, he, he would be very eagerly uh, working on the, uh, uh, the, the thinking about the experiment. Now he's also, He's a, he is 
a very good writer, but very hard to get started. And that was maybe a story I should tell here, because it also relates to a former director here. Uh, during the Great Depression, Ed Condon, later director here, couldn't get a job in physics. It, it, no, no one else could either. There's no, no discredit to him. Nobody got his degree around that time uh, did. But he was a great friend of Robbie's, and he used Robbie to keep him up in the field of physics. The, the, job, the best job that Conan could get was being night, night reporter for the Daily News. Uh, and uh, this being, you know, you report to the court cases who's brought in for prostitution, try to make an interesting story about it. But this did teach Ed Conan how to be a very good writer. He had to do this right. But then he would come around and visit uh, Robbie's lab and, uh, uh, and keep up on physics, because he really was very deeply interested in physics, even despite those difficult times. Uh, well, and this is a story I've told in the presence of both Robbie and Conan, so I know it's confirmed by both of them. Uh, Ed Conan, I'll give Ed Conan's version of it. Uh, uh, came into Robbie's office, and Robbie wasn't there. Now says Ed Conan, what do you do when you visit a friend's office and he isn't there? You read his mail. So, <laughs> so he read what was on the top of uh, Robbie's desk. And Robbie had invented uh, somewhat, for one of his more minor papers, but nevertheless, he go run a new method of making a uniform magnetic field under certain circumstances, and was trying to write this out. And what Conan found on top of his desk were a bunch of, of uh, papers uh, that be would always begin. Uh, new method for mag uniform magnetic field, I, I, Robbie, Columbia University. Maxwell has crossed out. Another one that said uh, new method, et cetera, same beginning. Uh, it is important to have uh, uniform magnetic fields for big X2. Stack of about uh, 10 or 15 pages each of which got no further than about the first sentence. Uh, well, Ed Conan knew what Robbie was doing. There was a typewriter in the room. He didn't, was a reporter. He could write, type, run that very well. He went over and typed out what he thought uh, Conan intended, what, what uh, Robbie intended to say. And about the time he'd finished, Robbie came in the room, and Robbie had said, Ed said, uh, how are things going, Robbie? He said, absolutely, Robbie said, terrible. I've got this paper to write. I've been working on it all day. I can't get beyond the first paragraph. And uh, I had handed it in and said, what do you think of this? He had it in the paper. Robbie read it, went over, got an envelope and a stamp, and mailed it into the physical review. <laughs> now, there's an interesting sequel to that. It occurred many years later. I was at Middlebury College. They'd had a very fancy lecture, a new lectureship that had just started. Middlebury College is primarily a uh, liberal arts college. And uh, they had a series once a year. They had an outside lecture. The first lecture in the series was Robbie. And I was the second one. And things went off. It seemed to go off fairly well. At the end of it, I was invited to dinner at the president's house. And he invited the top people there who were I think all of them non-scientists. They were the dean, and they were the, all in the humanities. And uh, they then asked, asked me the following confidential question, that the requirements of this lecture was, you know, you're supposed to give the lecture, but you were also supposed to uh, submit a written manuscript. And uh, 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 they hadn't gotten a written manuscript a year later. They had, still hadn't gotten a manuscript from Robbie. What do they think the chances of doing? Well, I know Robbie has great difficulty starting a paper. He usually has to have somebody else in the room to help get him started. And because we've written papers together. He does a lot of the writing, but if I needed to be there, he wouldn't write. Uh, I think he's only had one or two papers written by himself alone. They had some terrible misprints in it. But the, uh, in any case, uh, he, uh, the, uh, they, and I, I knew that if he hadn't written it in the year, first year, their chances were small. So I told him, well, I really think the chances are small. But then I thought in defense of Robbie. I said, look, he really has trouble getting started. He writes beautifully, but he has trouble starting. And I told this story. And I told this story previously to various friends, and they all did as you did. They laughed at the right time. They uh, <laughs> laughed when uh, Robbie said it in the paper. There was shock silence in the room. You know, I thought I'd use a dirty word unintentionally. I didn't know quite what had gone wrong. I felt that really the two cultures weren't, were not matching very well at that time. And 
Uh, finally, we sort of got the conversation, figure out what was wrong, show the real difference between science and the other. From the point of view of the science, I mean, Robbie, the real thing was the, was the paper, the ideas in the paper. But from the point of view of the historians and the humanists, it was the writing of it was important. And what they agreed, what would have been a right thing if this paper had been sent in as a paper uh, by Condon, with thanks to Robbie for the idea. Uh, and maybe if it had been sent in, a, it would have been very generous of Condon if it had been a paper by Condon and Robbie, but that it should be sent in as a paper by Robbie when somebody else wrote it. Terrible. Uh, so it shows really that. I felt that was one of the big differences between the, the two cultures, as they sometimes are called. Well, now let me shift to another thing. Uh, uh, Julian Schwinger. Uh, Julian uh, was a uh, was an under senior. The the year I was doing two years, I was doing a graduate uh, work there. <coughs> but he was also as an undergraduate. He was also our house theoretical. I mean, he worked with us and had did theoretical things uh, uh, relating uh, to what he was doing. And we had an interesting time. In fact, I frequently ate with him. But it was uh, he was at that time on a 12-hour phase shift. Uh, he, we would eat what was my supper and was his breakfast. And then he would go back to work. He'd work all night and then sleep all day. But it was a very nice uh, experience. I got to know him uh, very well. And uh, uh, then uh, he, well, a couple of things I'll say about that. Uh, he then, after a little later, it's, it's my time shifts back and forth a bit in this, uh, he'd done his really great thing on quantum electrodynamics. I mean, where he really developed a, a relativistic uh, quantum electrodynamics for the first time, and this was a, a, uh, a uh, sensational uh, thing. I don't think that the only time I've ever gone to a physical society meeting where, where the person was required to give the same lecture three times over. I mean, there was a time when De Carl Darrell was the secretary of the Physical Society. He didn't think much of theoretical physics. So the first lecture of Julian on this great new theory, establishing the first real successful field theory uh, with renormalization and all those things, was scheduled in a lecture room sitting, seating about 30 people. Well, it was filled up an hour and a half before the lecture, so most of us couldn't get big protests. So it got scheduled again in the biggest lecture room in the physics department. That was filled up an hour before uh, it was on. And finally, it was scheduled again in the Macmillan Theater, the big, big theater, even much bigger than this room. Uh, and that was also filled. Uh, so it was very sensational. But then uh, after that, I was uh, going with Robbie, uh, for inviting me to lunch at the faculty club. Well, now, there, we'd had a problem with uh, Julian. Uh, Julian was really considered a fair genius, uh, but uh, he, we couldn't get him into Phi Beta Kappa. Well, we did succeed in getting him, but he had a terrible time. I had to give pleas for them at that time because he'd failed a chemical physics course. Now, Julian Schwinger's method of taking courses was he would go in all the physics courses. He would go to about two or three lectures and decided he could learn more on his own than he would going to the lecture. So he wouldn't come to the lecture, um, but he'd take the exam and invent the answers to the problems right on that spot without having taken the course. And it worked out very well. It was tough on the instructor because there'd be this totally different solution. To the problem, he'd have to consult with other people whether the solution was right. Uh, but it was uh, very effective. And this had worked fine on his physics course. You would get A pluses. Uh, from these original creations. But uh, when he, uh, but I'd, I'd taken Lemaire's course, and it was a very dull course. Uh, I mean, he, uh, it was just uninteresting presentation, and he also had a, a very dull and uninteresting exam. I mean, his exam would say, prove the epsilon is equal to C plus D eta. But if you didn't, if you hadn't gone to the course, you didn't know what epsilon C and eta were. So Julian, uh, took this course, and he didn't understand what the questions were, so he handed in a blank paper. And Lamero came to Robbie and said, what should I do? Your, your great genius has uh, just failed my exam. 
And uh, expecting Robbie would say, well, you know, he does things differently and you should do special things, but that's not Robbie's way. Robbie said, did he really fail? And he said, absolutely, he did said nothing. Uh, well, Robbie said, are you a mouse or a man? Give him an F. So <laughs> Julian got an F out of that course. Well, after he gave this fantastic lecture, I think was probably the most, most productive lectures at any physical society meeting, which that meeting was in Columbia, after he developed his field theory, uh, and uh, 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 and uh, he uh, and, and then Robbie was taking me uh, to lunch. Who should be on the elevator with us but uh, Lemaire, who would give him an F at this course. And uh, Robbie, with characteristic twinkle in the eye, began saying, what a fantastic lecture they got. This is a real revolution in physics. This is the greatest thing that ever occurred at a physical society meeting, and so on. Well, Lemaire got more and more enthusiastic and said, who did this marvelous thing? And Robbie said, oh, you know him very well. Julian Schwinger, you gave him an F. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, uh, again, I could tell a lot of things about Schwinger, but I have to cut back for another. Uh, then uh, uh, let me shift to, uh, a, to Fermi. I had the very good fortune. I came back from uh, Cambridge University to Columbia to do my, start doing my graduate work. And uh, um, I've been there for about three or four months. We'd just gotten started on the first magnetic resonance magnetic experiments that Robbie had invented. So I had the good fortune to be able to get the first PhD in. Magnet, uh, with many kind of magnetic resonance, molecular beam magnetic resonance. And uh, 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 so I as well started on that. But then as an added bonus, Fermi received the Nobel Prize in Physics the following December. And uh, he was having trouble that in Italy his wife was Jewish and things, uh, the, the, the people there were finding to follow a little on the Nazi line of making Jews uncomfortable. And so he got the Nobel Prize. They allowed his whole family to go to Sweden to get it. And he already had an offer from Columbia University. So he just kept traveling with his family and showed up about the 20th of December at uh, uh, Columbia as a new professor. And uh, he was really a great person. I mean, I was really most impressed. He was. Uh, great scientist. He'd done both theoretical and experimental. I mean, uh, he, he, in fact, he was originally primarily theoretical, but he really shifted later to being primarily uh, uh, experimental. And he was a marvelous teacher. I mean, his lectures were uh, really very clear. In fact, I sometimes have lectured about three people I knew fairly well about their lectures, imagining myself asking the same question of them. One of them uh, would have been, uh, Oppenheimer, and one uh, uh, would have been Schwinger, and one have been Fermi. And basically the following would happen. I've really done this, never on the same question, but because I didn't, want, didn't ask the same question, but I've done it on other questions. But put, imagine now the same question. Namely, if you ask the question of Oppenheimer, <coughs> who, you would get an answer, and he would be impressed. Only a genius could have produced that. You don't know where the answer came from, it probably was right, but it might have been wrong. Uh, and it would be just produced by magic. Uh, and you realize that you, don't, you could thank heavens you're an experimental physicist because theoretical physics was done by people of a totally different intellect. Uh, and be very impressed by him for having that intellect. If you ask the same question of Schwinger, and you knew him well enough as I did, he would explain it. And you would understand the answer thoroughly uh, and of things you understand, but uh, you would never have been able to work that out for yourself. You say, thank heavens, I asked Julian about that. I mean, he would pull Gegenbauer functions out at the right time. I'd never heard of a Gegenbauer function <laughs> up to that time. But if you ask the same thing of Fermi, you didn't come away saying what a great genius he was. You'd kick yourself, why didn't you work it out yourself? I mean, he did everything with a variety of quantum mechanics, no more complicated than one. He didn't even use, for at least at that time, he wasn't even using delta functions. I mean, uh, he did everything with box normalization, uh, as you do in sort of elementary quantum mechanics. And he always got the right answers. And uh, he was a very impressive uh, uh, teacher. Uh, one of my closest friends at Columbia, Herb Anderson, uh, 
uh, was got his degree with Fermi and then continued on as his research associate. Well, both of them went to university, eventually the University of Chicago. He was a professor there and been working closely with Fermi. But Herb always had the difficulty with Fermi. Fermi, Fermi in the first place, had a, a way of life that sounded like that of a hard-working, conscientious, probably not very inspired person. I mean, he would get up at something like 6 in the morning, do theoretical physics for an hour or so before he got up and have breakfast early, get to the lab early, uh, and then promptly at noon he would stop for lunch. I mean, I know that occurred when they did the first reactor. They were about to uh, try it out and said, time for lunch. And they went out for lunch, came back for lunch, and then it did work after that. And uh, uh, this sounded like, the, and then he'd come home 5 o'clock and uh, 5.30, pretty early to leave the lab, and uh, play with the children for a while before dinner, and then do uh, analysis of the work in the lab at home. And for t very tough for, for Anderson, because Anderson would work out with great effort uh, the analysis of what they'd do, and then Fermi with just a much simpler and more ingenious approach, would work it out much faster. But, uh, uh, and it was very hard to beat him, but he was a really uh, great uh, person. Uh, and in fact, he, he, uh, he also was a, a sort of wonderful personality. I mean, he really, I've never seen him be jealous or, or uh, anything of that corn. The one time I sort of heard anything, a bit of resentment from him was, uh, when, when we were driving, I mean, number of, or I got to know him probably best was when we were at Los Alamos, and we used to have to, both of us to have, several times had to go to Washington by train, sharing a compartment uh, for a couple of days. He was a wonderful person to share a compartment with. I mean, one of the things, I learned a very valuable thing. He carried a little notebook with him that had key formulas, key constants, including things like uh, uh, the fundamental tensile properties of uh, of materials, and with this he could solve any problem. I mean, and he really would be willing to solve any problem, whether, whether one of the famous ones, this is a tale that is known, when he calculated uh, his, then he got a fresher ship at, at Rome, and uh, his, Laura Fermi was worried about the uh, coldness of the house, and they said, uh, did we not better get some storm windows? And, uh, uh, and uh, she and uh, uh, Enrico, with characteristic fashion, said, I'll make a calculation. He calculated what the heat uh, flow uh, would be uh, coming uh, in, and uh, he realized that this was negligible. His, his result was negligible compared to the amount that would come through the door by being open a certain direction. Huh? Everybody had confidence in, but then it got colder and colder and colder, and Laura <laughs> would say, but don't you... Uh, I uh, think you should uh, uh, check this again. He'd say, no, I've done the calculation. Everybody had cal well, finally, he repeated it, and one of the rare instances where he missed by a factor of 10, and though uh, they got storm windows, and sort of lived uh, uh, happy thereafter. Well, what I was starting to say, though, was the one time I saw, heard him speaking a little annoyed at somebody. We, on one of these train trips together, we were talking about his great beta ray paper. Uh, and uh, uh, this paper had been submitted to the Zeitschrift for the Physique and was rejected. It was rejected by Pauli, uh, who was infamous for doing such things. And uh, Pauli uh, said that, uh, uh, well, Pauli's the only other person. Obviously, he was a referee. And Pauli's a very honest fellow. When he's a referee, he tells everybody he's a referee. Uh, and uh, uh, from Pauli's point, he was the only person that ever talked about uh, uh, the neutrinos or anything like that. And so the paper went to him as a referee. And from his point of view, here was this naive fellow, Fermi, treating a neutrino. Pauli had introduced the idea of, a, of an undetectable neutrino just to conserve energy, because nobody knew how to solve problems if you didn't have energy conservation overall. And so you had this imaginary particle it would come out and take away the extra energy so you could do some other calculation, but nothing beyond that. And Pauli said, here's this naive fellow, Fermi, takes in this seriously and calculates the volume of phase space that goes with a neutrino exhibit for a real particle. Well, uh, Fermi was really very annoyed by that rejection. Uh, of course, he put it to another paper and it was published and came out. 
And what he said was, look, uh, if you have a model, even if you don't believe it, uh, you uh, should take it seriously and calculate with it. That's what he was doing. So uh, uh, this should be taken uh, seriously. And uh, uh, he and, and, and said Fermi, look, he'd already by that time done Fermi Dirac statistics and a bunch of other things. He should have had a good enough reputation to be allowed to slide on on that basis. So he was really rather annoyed by uh, Rutherford. And I think his point of view was quite correct. There's one question I wished I'd asked him, and it's too late to do so, and that is to ask him then, did he really, Fermi, did he really believe the neutrinos were there? This was before you know, neutrinos had been detected. And uh, I had a feeling he didn't. He was just thought it was a model to be taken seriously. But unfortunately, that's a question I cannot answer. Well, thank you very much.